This is a problem of particle kinetics that's going to be solved using the conservation of energy. And in this problem we have a weight, which we've assigned a, a weight of 50 pounds, falling onto a, uh, a spring. And the spring is between a, uh, a plunger and uh, the fixed base down at the bottom. The spring has a free length of 6 inches and a spring stiffness of 200 pounds per inch. We're going to look at a couple of variations of this problem. In the first one, we're going to drop the, the weight from rest from a height of 12 inches above the top of the spring, actually above the, the top of the plunger that the spring is attached to. And what we want to find is the maximum compression of the spring. So originally, the spring is at its free length. We drop the weight on it, and we want to see how much the spring is going to compress. Well, again, to solve this, we're going to use the uh, 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 principle of conservation of energy. So let's look at the energy state, both at the uh, initial uh, position where we're dropping the weight from, and the point of interest, which is when the uh, spring is, is compressed to its maximum amount. So here's the height that's dropped, 12 inches. And what we're trying to find is a uh, value that we'll call delta, the uh, uh, compression of the spring. Now, to uh, determine the potential energy, we need to calculate that uh, potential energy of the weight based on some datum. The choice of the datum is arbitrary, but uh, we're going to pick this uh, uh, bottom location here. So after the uh, spring has been compressed, we'll call that our datum for the potential energy due to the weight. Again, we could pick uh, any location we wanted to because what we're really looking at is the change in potential energy from one state to the other. So at the initially, we know that the velocity is zero. We're releasing it from rest. Therefore, the kinetic energy is zero. The potential energy of the weight is um, the weight times the height above the datum, which in this case is uh, h plus delta. And in the final state on the right, well, we know that the uh, weight is going to uh, come to a stop momentarily before it bounces back. So at the position of the maximum compression of the spring, we know that the velocity is zero, therefore the kinetic energy is equal to zero. Because of where we chose the datum, the potential energy of the weight is also equal to zero, but the spring is now compressed, and so it has stored energy, uh, which is also potential energy, of one-half k delta squared. So the principle of the conservation of energy says that uh, we can add the energy states initially and set that equal to the final energy state. And so substituting in the expressions from the previous slide, we have uh, this expression right here. And putting in our known values, the weight's 50 pounds, the height's 12 inches, the spring stiffness k is 200 pounds per inch. The only unknown is uh, delta, which will be in inches. And so we have a quadratic equation for that delta. And solving that, we come up with two roots, of course, one of which is negative, so is not of interest to us. And our answer is that the uh, spring will be compressed 2.71 uh, inches at the max. So let's run the SOLIDWORKS simulation here. Now this all takes place in uh, under half of a second, so I'm going to play this in, uh, in slow motion. So initially you'll see that the um, weight's at its 12-inch location. Now it's being dropped, makes contact, compresses the spring, and then is bounced back upwards. So we can check our uh, numbers by looking at a plot of, in this case, the top of the plunger here. And so what we're going to show is the displacement of that plunger, its, its position um, in the y-axis, or position vertically. And so you can see we started out at a height of 7 inches, and at the place where it's um, uh, compressed the most, that value is down to about 4.3 inches, so 2.7 inches uh, agrees roughly with our calculations. And of course, remember, any time we do a, a simulation, we, uh, it's a physical model that, that does have some, uh, uh, some inaccuracies in it. Uh, we could uh, certainly change the number of time steps and change that answer just a little bit. Uh, also, we, uh, we're not including any energy due to the plunger here. We're assuming that it's weightless, but of course we do have to give it a small amount of, uh, of mass uh, to be able to do the analysis in SOLIDWORKS. But uh, certainly to two, two significant digits, 
uh, our analysis agrees with the uh, simulation result here. Now the second case we want to look at, uh, we're going to uh, push the weight down onto the spring so that the spring is compressed by three inches and then we're going to release it. And so in this case what we're trying to find is how high the weight uh, uh, will be uh, propelled up into the uh, upward measured from its initial pl initial point that is measured from the top of the compressed spring. So once again we'll look at the energy states. To begin uh, the spring has been compressed a total of three inches and what we're trying to determine is the final height uh, again relative to the initial compressed position. So once again we need to establish our datum and we'll do that with the at the lowest value again so that uh, initially our energy state is that the um, kinetic energy is equal to zero because we're releasing from rest again because of where we've chosen the datum the potential energy of the weight is equal to zero but the spring is compressed um, delta which in case is three inches and so we do have the potential energy of the spring. At the top um, once again, the velocity is equal to zero because at the maximum uh, value of uh, the height, the velocity will have, uh, will have gone to zero before it starts to drop again. And so the potential energy of the weight is, uh, again, the weight times the distance above the datum, which is WH, and the spring is now uncompressed, so no potential energy there. So applying our conservation of energy equation again, uh, this time uh, delta is known k is known, the weight is known, so the height is the only unknown, and we can solve for that, and it turns out to be 18 inches. So here's the simulation. Again, we've started out with the spring compressed so that the, uh, uh, the plates that are originally 6 inches apart are now 3 inches apart, so 3 inches of compression on the spring. And whoops, run the simulation here, I'm trying to highlight the spring so we see it as well. And there you can see the uh, weight being uh, projected upwards and then starting to fall back down again. So in this case, we'll plot the uh, top surface here. And we can see that that started out at a height of 5 inches and made it up here not quite to 23 inches, but uh, but pretty close, so again our 18 inch uh, uh, calculation looks pretty good. Now before we leave that problem, let's go back to the, uh, uh, to the first case where we had the, uh, the weight that was falling. And uh, again here's the uh, solution symbolically, so without putting in the, the numbers that we did earlier, we can go ahead and rearrange that a little bit and um, uh, come up with the, the quadratic equation for delta in terms of W, uh, H, and K. Now you can see I've divided through by K and so we, we end up with this parameter W over K which we'll talk about in just a moment. So again using the quadratic uh, formula to solve this W over K, we can call that delta static because if we just place the weight on top of the spring, that's the amount that the uh, spring is going to deflect. And so we can again simplify that a little bit. And rearranging it, we come up with our final uh, value here. So the amount of spring compression is uh, a function of the, that static um, uh, deflection. But also you notice in the, um, uh, in the term here we have h over delta static. So it's the height uh, relative to the static deflection that's, uh, that's of concern here. So if you plug in, plug in the values that we had earlier, uh, the weight's 50 pounds, uh, 200 pounds per inch for the spring stiffness. So just under the static uh, load of the weight, the deflection would be a quarter of an inch. And so what we have in the uh, brackets there, or in the uh, parentheses, is a multiplier on that, which turns out to be 10.85. So the, the uh, value of deflection by dropping the weight from 12 inches is 10.85.
almost 11 times greater than just setting the weight on um, uh, in a quasi-static or static uh, mode. Now it turns out that uh, this is an application that you'll see in mechanics and materials that is impact loading. So if we take uh, for example a beam and we put a weight on the beam, we usually assume that that weight is a static load or at least it's applied slowly enough to be called a quasi-static load and in mechanics and materials you learn the uh, uh, learn how to calculate that static deflection. But we can also uh, idealize this beam's response as that of a linear spring. That is we put a certain weight on it we get a certain deflection and there's a linear relationship between those two. On the other hand if we drop the weight instead of applying it uh, applying it in a quasi-static uh, manner, then we can calculate the uh, total deflection, again based on the formula that we just came up with, with our falling weight in a spring. That is, if we call n a multiplier here, then we just take the uh, static weight and multiply it by this, uh, this multiplier that's shown here. And again, the, the relative number here that's important is how high is it, uh, is it dropped from relative to the amount that that weight would cause a deflection in the static case. And if you plot uh, that multiplier up against that uh, ratio, h over the static deflection, you get a curve that looks like this. Now one of the interesting things about this is that if that ratio is zero, in other words we're not really dropping it, but we're just applying it all at once instead of uh, applying it over slowly over time, you could see over at the far left hand uh, side of this curve that there is a multiplier of two. Now to see what that uh, means, let's go back to SolidWorks for just a moment and do one more motion study. So in this case we've placed the weight on top uh, of the unstretched or uncompressed spring assembly and let it go. And of course we get a very small deflection and we get some oscillations there too since there is no friction or no damping uh, built into our model here. But if I look at the displacement of the weight, whoops, you can see that the total, um, the maximum deflection here is not a quarter of an inch, it's a half an inch. So just from the fact that we uh, apply the load all at once instead of letting it build up slowly over time results in this multiplier of two that you see right here. Uh, a couple of other things uh, to note about this is that uh, in addition to the deflection in um, mechanics problems both the stress and strain get multiplied by n as well again as long as uh, all the response is, is linear. So this becomes a good uh, first cut at looking at uh, the stresses due to impact loads. One other thing you notice about this too is that uh, the stiffer the structure the greater the multiplier. So for example if we have a beam, let's say a steel beam for which the, uh, we're dropping a weight and the ratio of the height relative to the static deflection is 60 then you can see we would have a multiplier of 12. If on the other hand we took that same beam, same geometry, and made it out of aluminum instead, then uh, aluminum being a third as stiff, then our ratio of the height to the static deflection would actually go down all the way to 20, and so our load multiplier would only be 7. So uh, a structural designer, if you're going to have impact loads, has, has to balance. Sometimes you want a stiffer structure, you want to limit the deflections, but in doing so it can actually make it uh, uh, more susceptible to damage due to impact loading.